What I did last week, we're talking about the life of Elijah, and what I did is we kind of paused for a minute as we're talking about Elisha and the torch kind of being passed off to him, so to speak. And so I stopped, backed up, and we looked at Elisha because uh, that's a big part of Elijah's life. And we talked about how the importance of having an Elisha. And now we come to the very end of the life of Elijah, except that I think we'll have two more messages after this. I think I'll probably talk about uh, Elijah's spirit as it relates to uh, John the Baptist, and then we'll talk about the um, transfiguration and then possibly the two witnesses, but I think we'll probably just get two messages out of that. And anyway, <clears throat> so uh, I want to finish this last story. And this is a very important, very famous part of the scripture where Elijah goes up into heaven. He's the only one where you really see it happen this way. Now, we do read in Genesis uh, about Enoch, and Enoch, you know, walked with the Lord, and then he just goes up into heaven. I, I, we don't know a whole lot of details on that, but he was, the Bible just says, and he was not, because God took him, right? Uh, if you read Hebrews' account. And so, uh, so you know, the, this is a unique situation where a man's just living, and then all of a sudden, However it happens, however it takes place, boom, he goes up to heaven in, a, in this interesting way. And uh, I want to just mention real quickly, the title of the message is The Chariot of Fire. I promised my family I wouldn't make a joke about chariots of fire. But <laughs> the title is a, The Chariot of Fire. And um, uh, obviously I'm going to talk, the whole message is going to be primarily about that and the significance of that. But... If you just think about this ending of Elijah and how he ended, how he went up to be with the Lord, that creates a lot of questions in my mind, a lot of things to think about in regards to how he went up. A lot of people have made a, a connection there with the rapture and have tried to say, like, he's a, that's a picture of the rapture. Like, you know, they say that the church goes up, you know, just like Elijah went up. And then what's really interesting is then they say, like, and then... Uh, uh, Noah's Ark, you know, represents the judgment of God coming out. And, and that just, it, that's quite a stretch if you really think, think about it. However, in my mind, I still think about the fact that Elijah going up to heaven in that manner would be similar to us going up in the rapture, you know, and, you, you know, somebody could speculate or say, like, how do you know that his body goes up? I mean, I mean, in the rapture, like the body goes up and how did Elijah, like, how do you know? It went up, and how does that work exactly? And I don't know how much thought you've given to that, <clears throat> um, because I, I I believe the Bible is very clear that the entire body goes, just goes somewhere, right? And you remember the you you know the old uh, you know the Left Behind or whatever. I never even watched that, but you know I've seen stuff like that. And they and they talk about like in the rapture, like all of a sudden like clothes are just left behind. And I think they get that idea. I've heard him explain it this way, two, two different ways. Number one, they say, well, when Elijah went, he left his mantle behind. And then they say, well, when Jesus went up, he left the clothes, right, that were folded up real neatly or whatever. And so, the, so they say, like, well, so I guess whenever we go up in the rapture, we would just leave our clothes, <laughs> you know, which is interesting. Like, and I don't even know, you're kind of wondering what I'm going to say about that. Like, I, I just don't know. To me, that doesn't make sense. You know, it's like what what gets left behind. You know, what about what about my wedding ring? You know, if I go up in the rapture with a wedding ring, just ding ding ding, and that creates a whole whole other thing. What about organ donors? <laughs> Ever think about that? Like I got someone else's kidneys, and then all of a sudden uh, they go up in the rapture and I don't. What happens? Just <laughs> kidney just disappear or whatever. You got to kind of spend too much time like overthinking these things, <laughs> wondering how that happens. Uh, you know, gold gold teeth and stuff. <laughs> you know, all kinds of things that uh, that that creates interesting situation. I'll tell you what I think. I uh, don't know for sure, right? But I think it would be interesting if that's the case. Like I said, you could almost think like, well, why do we even take the skin with us? Like, why doesn't the whole body just kind of and just the soul goes up into heaven? Well, let me just start just, I mean, this really doesn't have anything to do with the message, but I just want to do it anyway. So 1 Corinthians 15, uh, let's, let's nail this down because I really do believe that our bodies go up into heaven. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 
Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this corrupt must put on, I mean, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall, we be, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So, so we look at that and we think about you know, the fact that our bodies are going to change somehow. We're going to go from this corruptible flesh to an incorruptible flesh. And how does that take place? I really don't know. I really don't know. But I don't think it has anything to do with our literal atoms that we have on us right now, like just rising up from the grave or, or whatever, because, yeah, I mean, the atoms maybe, I don't know how God's going to put that back together, but it's not like that rotten flesh or whatever, you know, here the bodies that are in the sea just kind of come up and like zombies is, uh, and go, I, just, I don't see it like that. I see God just boom, giving the, the souls a purified body. Now, what about those who are alive and remain? You know, those that come up out of the ground given a glorified body somehow, because obviously not everyone's going to come out of the ground. You know, some people have been in there long enough where there's nothing left, right? So God's given them a glorified body. What about those people who have their body? Well, I believe we're given a glorified body too, but you remember this all happens so fast in the twinkling of an eye that it's just like you're here and then boom, you're gone. And, uh, and here's what I think, okay? This is just my speculation. I've always thought of it in comparison to the opposite, which would be, you know, uh, when the earth swallowed up Korah and the sons of Korah and the earth just opened up and swallowed them up and they went down. How many of you guys think they just kept their body and it made it all the way to hell? And to this day, like they have their physical body in hell. No, because this is, this, this is a corruptible body. It wouldn't survive that heat. The soul, you know, lives on, but the, the body would just corrupt. Same as us. If we went up into the atmosphere this body would just disintegrate. It would, it would be no more, right? So, so we're not thinking about this body. We're thinking about this, this incorruptible body that God's going to give us. Now, it's going to look just like this body, like a perfect, perfect, uh, you know, uh, like a replica of this body or something like this. I have no idea. These are interesting things. That's why I'm bringing it up because I think it's interesting. All right, so, uh, so there's a lot of questions that we have. But this mantle is left behind. And uh, really, that, here's the other thing. That's all that's left behind. It doesn't say anything about it. You know, I don't think that's the only thing he... You know what a mantle is? Like, basically, you have your clothes on. The mantle is just like an overcoat that's basically a coat. Like, you could either use it, you know, you put this, like, big... Think about a big blanket. Like, if you're sleeping, you could cover up with it. But if you're walking around and it's cold, you could just put it over you. You could maybe even put it over your head. Uh, or just wrap it around you, whatever, like a poncho. You know, this is what they had. And so when he goes up, he leaves that behind, and it's kind of like Moses' rod. You know, this is the thing that he that, that Elisha is going to hold on to, and it's going to actually be a, a vessel by which God is going to bring these miracles and, get, and show his power. It's just, the way, it's just the way that it is. It has nothing to do with, you know, the way in which Elijah goes up into heaven. <clears throat> but in verse 11... Of our text there in 2 Kings 2. Second Kings 2 verse 11 says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So there's this, this flash of light, it looks like a fire, right? And, it, and, and it's pic, depicted as a chariot and horses of fire. Chariot of fire, horses of fire. And it parts, it right, goes right up in the middle between Elijah and Elisha and separates them, this, this, this light. And then some sort of whirlwind just takes him up. That's all we're given. Like We don't understand the significance of it. We don't know why he said that. Uh, you know, there's really no clear, you know, reason for that. <clears throat> and so it makes you wonder, like, why would he even talk about the chariot of fire? Why, you know, why is that significant? 
Because if many people used to talk about a fire or a chariot of fire or a whirlwind of fire, people would point to this story, but they might miss the fact that actually this picture that we're talking about is all throughout the whole Bible. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, but first, let me point this out. Think about the ways in which God reveals himself to man. Many times in the Bible, it's talked about uh, different things like a cloud, you know, a cloud of fire, a cloud of smoke. Remember that in uh, Exodus? Uh, it talks about a, uh, uh, or a pillar, I guess, pillar of cloud. It talks about uh, smoke. It talks about a wind. It talks about a whirlwind. It talks about a whirlwind of fire. All these kinds of things. All those things that I just mentioned, here's what they have in common. You can see them, you know, but you, if you were tried to reach out and grab a fire, and obviously you would feel the effect of it, you'd feel the heat, but as far as what it's made out of, you wouldn't be able to grab onto a fire. You wouldn't be able to grab onto smoke. You wouldn't be able to grab onto wind. You wouldn't be, so you, you see what I'm saying? I believe what we're talking about, a real substance that is, that is being seen, but it's not something that you can actually, uh, you can actually grab onto. I don't think that's a coincidence that God's always described in these different ways. So the first point that I want to point out is this. <clears throat> I do believe that this is a literal picture of God and the spirit world, you know, like angels, cherubims, seraphim, all these kinds of things. Uh, the, the, this is real. He's actually seen this is what is what I believe. So let's look uh, at several places in the Bible. I'm real. I, I really like this. It's interesting. I, I've probably gone through this before at some point. Uh, but since we're talking about the chariot of fire here, I think it's interesting to look at. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And I'll talk about on the next point what, what I think the significance of this is, or at least an application that we can take from it. Okay, so Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 24. First time we see anything about fire or something like that. So he drove out man and he placed at the east of garden, the uh, garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now we don't, he doesn't describe the cherubims. He just ex describes the sword as being a flaming sword. Okay. And we'll see that later. Go to uh, chapter 15 of Genesis. Chapter 15. Look at verse 9. All right, so this is an interesting uh, story, kind of uh, kind of weird, actually. Abraham, or Abram at this point, is having a, a, a conversation with God, and God, he's entering into a covenant. And so let's go, starting in verse 9, it says, And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took on him all these, all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Ab Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land, which is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation there shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full." And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same, and, and the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river of, uh, great river of the river Euphrates. All right, so this is a weird thing. You know, why separate all the animals that way? and spread them all out, their parts and stuff like that. That's, that's weird. I, I can't answer that, okay? Why does God show like a burning lamp, you know what I mean, to uh, consume those? I don't know. Why does he have sacrifices that are consumed by fire or they put something upon the, the, uh, sen uh, the, uh, the censers, you know, the incense on the censers, and then God just like brings down fire. You know, the Holy of Holies, just filled with the whole room, just filled with smoke so much that they can't even go in there because there's just so much smoke. Why does God manifest himself these ways? 
I, I don't really know, but it's very consistent throughout the Bible that these types of things happen. Look at Exodus now. Exodus chapter 3. This is a familiar story. Exodus chapter 3. In verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in, that's talking about Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, again, this is a weird thing. What is this substance? Well, this is God showing himself, manifesting himself somehow. And there's this substance that is described as a fire, described as a bush that's burning, yet the actual bush itself isn't burning. There's just this, this flame that's there. And at the time, it's not consuming anything. But make no mistake about it, when God is described as a fire, it's not like this fire that you can just touch and it's not going to hurt you. God's described as a consuming fire, right? Look at Hebrews, and uh, uh, we'll come back to this verse in, uh, in, Psalm here in a little, Psalms in a little bit. But look at Hebrews. All right, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. And of the angels he said, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? Okay, and so we see this reference to uh, his angels and his ministers being fire. And of course, the Bible says that God's a consuming fire. Now, he didn't consume that burning bush. But God is a consuming fire. We'll look at that. All right, uh, let me see here. Moving on, go back to, you're in Exodus 4, unless you lost your place. Uh, look at Exodus 13. Exodus 13, little sword drill this morning. Exodus 13, look at verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light and uh, light to go by day and night. All right. So God leads them through the wilderness for quite some time, 40 years, basically. And he's leading them as a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud at, uh, uh, during the day. Look at chapter 19. All right. So you realize chapter 20 is where he gets the Ten Commandments. So in 19, he's on the mountain and he's preparing for this. And God is... Uh, uh, making himself known actually in the people's eyes that he's communicating with Moses. And here's what we see in chapter 19, starting verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voices of the trumpet, uh, trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at, ne at the nether part of the mountain uh, of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it with uh, uh, in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of the furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. So we see here once again that, you know, there's this whole mountain, you know, is kind of consumed by this fire. And there's thundering, there's lightning. A lot of times this is also a description of God, not only with the, 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 the big fire, you know, but you also have the booming and the lightning. Now think about, think about you know, storms are pretty scary. There's been times that we're on our way home, uh, you know, during a rainy season, I guess what you'd call rainy season. And we're on our way home and we're going through the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Flint Hill, <laughs> and it's not really Flint Hill, but kind of like prairie looking grasses and nothing on the side. And the storms come down and the lightning, you think, man, I'm going to be struck by this lightning. It's going to fry us. We're going to all die. <laughs> because that, that power that you see in the lightning, you know, imagine being on a ship in the middle of a sea 
and you and, and those kinds of that kind of lightning and thundering is going on you'd be you'd be like these people they're trembling they're scared i'm not going on the mountain we're going to die if we go up on the mountain but it wasn't lightning and thunder it was god himself and so it was more powerful than that more powerful than anything that you could imagine and we think about it anytime somebody in the bible meets with god like they see a glimpse of god or an angel or whatever representation of god they fall on their face and they're trembling and they're scared because they realize, like, I just actually saw, you know, uh, a, a depiction of God or, or whatever. And, I, and they saw it and they're scared. And, and many, many times, I, there's many places in the Bible I'm not even going to right now, but many times Isaiah and, and all these different prophets, they see this and they fall on their face. Okay, um, let's keep going here. Chapter 40. Exodus 40. Verse 34, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went on onward in their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, uh, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken. Okay, so, uh, so this was how God operated. When they saw that moving of the cloud, then they, then they would follow it. Now, various times in Elijah, because remember we're talking about the life of Elijah. So would any of this information about the, about the fire and the chariots fire and all the burning or whatever, would he be privy to any of this? I believe he would. I believe it was understood and it was talked about. And all the prophets probably would have talked about how God had been manifested and how they saw him. And so uh, this wasn't like a brand, a, a brand new thing. You know, you go through the temple, uh, you know, because Elijah is obviously after the temple's built, Solomon and everything. And, uh, and so that is how God had operated and he dwelt in the holies of holies. And there was always fire and stuff like that involved. Now look at, uh, uh, let's, go, let's go back to Hebrews and look at that verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. When we talk about the tabernacle that was built, I know this might this is a lot of like this is a study, all right? We're looking at a lot of scriptures, and I hope it's not boring to you. I hope it's exciting to you. But either way, just just try to follow follow me here, okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter nine. Then verily the first covenant. Now he's going to talk about the uh, the tabernacle. The first, I mean, the uh, the temple, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly san uh, sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that buddeth and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Okay, So he's talking about this mercy seat that they knew about. They knew it existed. They talked about it. And they said there's this mercy seat, and seat doesn't necessarily mean a place that you sit. It's talking about like a seat, like the, the seal or the top of, of something. Okay, so they had this box, and on top of the box is this seat. And on top of that seat are these cherubim. And it's like, hey, we can't even speak particularly about that. I think what he's getting at is like, we don't really know what that looked like. I mean, who knows what cherubims look like? You know, who knows what this, you know, the, the, this looked like exactly. exactly. And so, uh, and so this was significant, though, because any reference that we do have in the Bible of what a cherubim looks like, guess what it has to do with? Fire, thundering, lightnings, all these kinds of images that we see. And I'm going to show you that real quickly in Ezekiel. All right, we'll just look at Ezekiel 1. It also describes it in Ezekiel 10, uh, very sim the same imagery, slightly different details, but it's the, same, it's the same image. So let me 
just read this Ezekiel chapter one. Let me see here. Let's start with verse four. See if some of these words ring a bell to you. I looked and behold, a whirlwind. That sounds familiar now, doesn't it? A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it. And out of the midst there of the color of amber, out of the midst of, a fi of the fire. Also about the midst uh, thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had hands of a man under their wings, you know, the four sides. Uh, and they had four, uh, I mean, sorry, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their, uh, their, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they all had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had, uh, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one uh, were joined one uh, one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Whether the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And that sounds like the same, you know, imagery whenever Abraham was, was laid out those, you know, sacrificed parts on the ground and, and the, the burning lamp comes through here. Look what it says. And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creature ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures uh, with his four faces. Now, I, I won't explain the wheel and all that. And when I preached through Ezekiel, you know, I went into detail about what the, you know, the different, what they look like. And we looked at other places in the Bible. But what I'm saying is that you get to Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, you know, even Revelation 4 and like different places in the Bible where it talks about these cherubim. You might be tempted to say like, what is he? Yeah, he's out there by the river of Kibar. What did he accidentally eat the wrong mushrooms or what's going on? <laughs> I mean, because who, who has these kinds of visions? Who has a vision of a, of a, of a being with four different faces? You got an ox on this side. You got a man on this side. You got a, 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 a lion on this side. And you got an eagle on this side. That's weird. Who came up with that? You know what? Here's who came up with it. The people that actually saw it and they're explaining the best that they can. But all they know is that this is a cherubim that came down. And in this in this description, if you look there, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, in this description, there's four of them and they're spread out and they're carrying something that's just called a firmament. And on that firmament is a throne. And on that throne sits God, you know, or the son of man or, you know, and so. You know what that would look like if you just kind of got a glimpse of that and that was following through and you see these 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 beasts, these creatures, and you see this this you know throne and and all of it's like looks like fire and lightning and all that kind of thing. You'd probably say, Boy, that looked like a chariot that just went by. Okay. So I believe that this is a real, like a literal picture of God and uh, the spirit world. Now, God the Father, obviously is spirit, nobody's seen him. But you can see uh, evidence of him and uh, and whatever this is. I mean, obviously, the creatures that were made, the cherubim, Satan himself, Lucifer was a cherub, cherub and, uh, and it's described all these ways. If you read in, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's Isaiah or Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel, where it talks about Lucifer and how he was uh, he was created and and how he was in the Garden of Eden and all that. OK, so uh, so I believe this is this is real because this would be a weird thing to just make up. And if it was only one time in Scripture, you'd be like, that was kind of weird. Like, what is that even about? Maybe it's just all symbolic, and then you would just pass it off. But the thing is, from the very beginning of the Bible and all up to, the, to Revelation, this is consistent, that what we're talking about is an actual visit from God at some, in, in, at some level. 
Okay, and so uh, so it's very interesting. Now look at uh, Psalm 104. All right, Psalm 104. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment? Who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain? Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angel spirits his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundation of the earth that it should not be removed forever, who uh, 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 thou coverest, in, uh, coverest it with the deep as with the garment, the waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled, at the voice of, the, of, the, uh, voice of thy thunder they hasted, away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound uh, that they may not pass over and they turn not again to cover the earth. Look at, uh, let me see here, back up to chapter 18. Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, let me see here. 18 verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into my, his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because, of he, because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub, isn't that interesting, and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret places, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick cloud passed hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the high, highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Let me see how far am I supposed to read here. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of water were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the, of the breath of thy nostrils, he uh, sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. And so, you know, anyway, you see the pictures like he's riding a cherub of, the, uh, you know, he's riding a, a, a chariot on top of the cherubs. And there's this lightning and there's this, you know, lots of reference to fire. And this is interesting. He also talks about hail. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but when you get into book of Revelation and God pouring out his wrath, which incidentally, read, read Revelation 7 on your own sometime if you want to see it. But incidentally, the moment that God's people are taken from the earth in the rapture, you know, you see the, the, the heavens departing are, are rolled back as a scroll. And then what's going to follow that? You're going to see all kinds of judgment. It's going to be fire. You know, God's going to baptize the earth by fire. Uh, it's, it, it has to do at some point towards the end, you see hail coming down and you see, uh, you see all this stuff, all the judgment of God. This is consistent all through the Bible. Okay, so I believe it is a literal picture of God when we read about the fire and the lightning and all that kind of stuff. But not only that, I do believe that fire from just our human perspective and our human understanding of what a fire does is the perfect... Uh, uh, analogy of God's character. Okay, let me show you a few things. Look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. <clears throat> Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire? 
saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Very interesting that God is not only referred to as a fire, but His Word is referred to as a fire. And if you think about what a fire does, a fire, first of all, is pure, right? How do you clean something, you know, that's a precious metal or whatever? They, they run it through the fire, you know, and if all the impurities didn't get out, they run it through the fire again, right? Psalm, uh, Psalm 12, 6 says the words... It says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay, so when we read God's word, we're talking about something that is pure. Okay, something that is like a fire, according to Jeremiah. Something that, you know, is perfect. And, uh, and here's what a fire does. A fire not only purifies, a fire also reveals. You know, it re reveals that which is good. Right? You know, you, all the impurities are gone. Now what you have left is something that's good. And the fact that it burned all those other things up and turned them into ashes says, that, you know, it destroys that which is bad and reveals that which is good. So turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Again, our God is a consuming fire. It's, it's important to understand this is very literal. Also something that we could consider as being very symbolic. Somebody we ought to, something that we ought to, and someone that we ought to take very seriously, don't you think? If we come to God in prayer, we ought to be very serious about that, right? If, uh, if God is going to reveal a sin in our life, and he's going to judge that, we ought to take it seriously, not be like, you know what, I think I can handle it. I think I can tango with God. No. When he is ready to, to pour out his wrath, there's no resisting it. There's no getting around it. So there has to be a sense of fear. You say, oh, no, he's God. He's so loving. He's so kind. There's no sense to fear God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, if you want to live right, you want to do right in this world, you want to understand wisdom, the first thing you need to do is have fear of the Lord. He's going to keep you out of trouble. You're going to be like, man, I don't want to do that because if I do that, God's a consuming fire and I'm going to be in trouble. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, what's the foundation? Well, verse 3, no founda uh, other foundation can no man lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, I've, you know, this is a popular verse. I don't, I don't apologize for this. We could read this every single service and it would never get old. This is such a great passage. The foundation of your faith is Jesus Christ. Okay, If you're, found, if you're basing your salvation on anything else, your, your stability, your, you know, your, the, you're going to build on your life. Any, on any other foundation, it's pointless. It's sinking sand. It doesn't, it, there's nothing. Okay, The foundation of your faith is Jesus Christ. I put my trust in Him. I can't get to heaven on my own. Uh, you know, He did all the work. Right? That's foundational. Everything else that you do in this life is building upon that foundation. Right? And so here's what it says. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This is a great passage of scripture for eternal security. Because a lot of people don't do the works. A lot of people didn't build upon that foundation, but they still have that foundation. They still have faith in Jesus Christ. They're still going to heaven, yet so as by fire. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're still, their works amounted to nothing in this life. You know, anything they did, they worked for, their wealth, uh, their possessions, that didn't mean anything. You know, their reputation uh, didn't mean anything. None of that meant anything except for what they did for Christ. And so you put gold, silver, precious stones on the foundation, and you try that thing by fire, ah, they're going to last. You put wood, hay, and stubble, on that foundation, there's going to be nothing left. We're going to go camping uh, tomorrow. I heard the, I'm pretty sure the weather's going to be great. I'm hoping there's going to be some good fires that are built. But at the end of that camping trip, most likely it's just going to be a big old pile of ashes, right? Because that stuff was burnt to the ground. 
except for occasional Coke bottle or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and the idea is, you know, the things that you do in this life, it's all going to get burned up, all going to get burned up. Now, hopefully some things will be left, which we're going to, what you would be able to offer to the Lord and say, I did this for you, Lord. And he's going to re and he's going to reward those who did, uh, did things for him in this life. The more you do, the more rewards, the more you give up in this life, the more he's going to bless you in heaven. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a, <laughs> you know, like a prosperity gospel. The more you give, the more God's going to bless you. Like I said, I'm not even talking about money. I'm just talking about your life. If what you're willing to sacrifice and give to the Lord in your life, God, it's not like God's going to be like, eh, well, that was a waste. God is going to bless you because you did it for him. And if you did it for him, uh, then that's something that you're laying up rewards in heaven. But we ought to take the idea very seriously of God being a consuming fire. Very serious that He's the one that's going to try our works. We are going to be found. What, we've actually, what we actually have for the Lord will be found out. And what we've done will be burned up. Okay, so God is a consuming fire. You can't go against Him. He will judge the world by fire one day. You can read that in Revelation. You'll see a lot of the same illustrations. Again, uh, once, that, once that scroll is rolled back, the heavens is rolled back like a scroll, then God's going to make himself known. There's going to be lots of fire. There's going to be lots of hail and destruction and lightning and earthquakes and trembling and people running into the mountains and wanting them to fall on them because they're so terrified. And this is uh, because, you know, if you don't have, let's put it this way, if you don't have fear of God, just like many people up until that point in the, in the you know, when the wrath of God's poured out, many people have even been persecuting the saints. They've been living in their fornication and adultery and, and, uh, and idolatry and all the things that it talks about, and yet they don't repent. They continue walking that way because they're just like, hey, I'm getting away with it, no big deal. And they're, and they're going, going, going. Well, then whenever God uh, pours out his judgment, uh, it will uh, consume perfectly. Now I realize that's talking about works and judgment and all that stuff. Again, not a reflection on our eternal salvation. Uh, but God will judge the world with fire. It makes that clear. Jesus made it clear. And then we see it in the book of Revelation. Also, a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament. And then uh, finally, this is interesting. After everything is gone and the world is dis destroyed. And then, of course, there's the thousand year reign. But then what goes on into eternity, all we know is it says, you know what? By the way, there's no sun because God is the sun, you know. There's no, you don't have to worry about a source of, of energy and heat and all these kinds of stuff. God's going to provide that because he is the light. He is the fire. He is the, uh, the source of energy that we need. And so it starts now, not just wait until eternity, right? It starts now recognizing that he is that source of energy and uh, he is the consuming fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the, the reality that we could go through this entire Bible, and it's all consistent, yet it was written by over 40 men. Most of them didn't even know each other. Uh, most of them, they weren't necessarily uh, comparing notes, uh, but they were spread apart, uh, even in different continents and over thousands of years. And yet they wrote eyewitness accounts of, of uh, pictures that match up very closely. We're not surprised by that, Lord, because we know it's your word. We know uh, that you gave it to us and, and expect us to have faith in it. And Lord, I pray that if we don't have faith in anything else, we'll have faith in Jesus Christ and understand that he is the foundation. And, uh, and we just pray that you'll help each of us to understand uh, the judgment of God that comes like a fire and, uh, and the revealing power and nature of the fire. And then we would also uh, realize that we need to do works for you that are going to withstand the fire in the end, uh, the, the gold and the silver and precious stones type, type works, Lord. Pray you be glorified with this church. Thank you so much for all you've done for it. I pray you continue to bless, help us in, uh, in, in rest, restoring uh, one another and, and loving one another and helping one another, Lord, to get through this life as we wait uh, uh, for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.